Welcome to the Unit 11 Lecture 2. This lecture is over Chapter 11, Section 2, and we're going to be looking at what causes slavery and plantations to increase in the South. The Industrial Revolution increased the numbers of goods that were being produced. So the amount of things that were being made increased with the introduction of factories and mills and steam engines and all that kind of stuff. So this increase, this also increased the need for raw materials. Raw materials are uh, things um, like trees. A tree is in its raw state, but then it gets made into paper. So a tree is in a raw material, and then paper is the finished good. Okay, um, one of these raw materials that we're going to be looking about at is cotton, um, which was grown in the South. Growing cotton was hard work. The cotton needed to be cleaned before it could be used. So with that in mind, you would have to basically take out little sticks and little twigs and little thorns out of the cotton itself, which is very tedious, tiring work, and it would take a long time and a worker could only clean about a pound of cotton a day which isn't you know it doesn't might seem like a lot but it's really not that much and you know if you can only clean a pound of day you can only sell a pound of day so you're really not making that much money this all changes in 1793 when Eli Whitney invent, invents the cotton gin um, cotton gin is short for cotton engine um, yeah, this is a cotton gin right here. Um, with this machine, workers could now clean up to 50 pounds of cotton a day. So that's a pretty big increase. If you were getting paid $1 a day, and then you get a raise to $50 a day, your life is probably going to change quite a bit. Um, basically, the idea of a cotton gin is that you take the raw cotton that still has all the twigs and the sticks and stuff like that, and you put it in this side, and then you turn this little thing, and it goes around and around, and then these little things right here in the machine separate the cotton, pull it apart, all the bad stuff that you don't want in the cotton falls out, and then you have good cotton over here on this side. So instead of doing it by hand you can now do it with this machine and you get 50 pounds of cotton a day which means that you can sell more cotton which means that you can grow more cotton um, this also means that because of the cotton gin the amount of cotton that could be grown increased and from 1790 to 1860 cotton production increased more than a thousand percent um, that's obviously quite a large increase um, and because of this, let's just take a look at this right here. Let's. Why does cotton growth increase, basically? Um, before the cotton gin, the only cotton that could be grown was long-fibered cotton because it was easier to clean. Long-fiber cotton can only be grown by the coast. Okay, so only like this area right here. Now, if we now have the cotton gin, short-fibered cotton can be used and that means that it can be grown all in this area as well so what that does is it allows more cotton to be grown and what do you need if you need if you are growing more cotton you need more labor so more cotton equals more labor and what does labor mean when we're talking about cotton in the South? We're talking about slaves. Okay, so more more cotton being grown, you need more labor, you need more slaves. So because of this increase in cotton production, the need for labor to harvest this cotton also increased. At this time, slave labor, slave labor, was used to harvest cotton. In 1808, it became illegal to import slaves from Africa. This is part of the three-fifths compromise in the in the uh, Constitution, if you remember back to that. Um, so, 1808, it becomes illegal to import slaves. However, the birth rate among slaves all that already were living in the in U.S. increased rapidly. So, there were a lot of slaves that were having children, and 
those children automatically become slaves, so they are adding to the slave population. So between 1810 and 1840, the slave population doubled. So just in 30 years, it doubled. Slavery divides the South into two groups. I mean, this is pretty simple. People that have slaves and people that, that did not have slaves. Slave owners, people who had slaves, were by far the wealthiest of the group, but they were relatively few in numbers. Why would people who have slaves be more wealthy than people who didn't have slaves? Well, first of all, wealthy people could afford slaves, but secondly, people who had slaves could grow more cotton because they had free labor to harvest all of that cotton that they were growing, which means if they're growing more cotton and they don't have to pay for the people to harvest it, they can sell the cotton, make more money than the people who can only grow enough cotton that they can pick on their own, basically. Um, so the slave owners are going to be more wealthy, but there are fewer of them in the South. Only about one-third of white families own slaves. And even though most white families owned few or no slaves, they still supported the idea of slavery in hopes that one day they would be able to buy slaves and be able to farm more cotton. Because more cotton gets you more money. And to farm more cotton, you need slaves. Because you need labor, and labor means slaves at this time. African Americans in the South. About half of enslaved people in the South worked on plantations. So that's, you know, 50%. Conditions on these plantations were very cruel. They could be cruel. This is a primary source. This is a quote from your book. Um, it's a... It's a quote basically stating what conditions were like in plantations or on a plantation. Um, basically, if you missed a piece of cotton in your row, no matter how much row there was, if you missed a little bit, you would get beat nearly to death. And that is not a good thing, obviously. So conditions were very cruel. Some enslaved people's did not work in on the plantations. They worked in the cities as servants or skilled craftsmen, like uh, blacksmiths or um, gunsmiths. Um, but these people were still enslaved, and under the law, they were considered property. So they got to work in the city, but they still were slaves. They didn't have any rights. They didn't get paid much. Um, they didn't get paid at all unless their slave owner allowed them to keep some of their earnings, which some slave owners did. As a result of that, a little bit, by 1840, 5% of African Americans were free. Um, the way they got their freedom was they were either born free, they were given it by their slave owner, or they bought it with some of the earnings that they saved up. These free African Americans still may face many problems, however, because they had very few rights, they had little rights, and they could be recaptured and sold into slavery again. So basically, even if you buy your freedom, you always have to be looking over your shoulder and making sure that you're not doing anything wrong, because if you do, you could be recaptured and sold into slavery. Families under slavery. Most slave owners would break families up, selling children to different places to their mothers. This caused, obviously, unforgettable grief. Imagine imagine if you're sitting at your dinner table with your family and all of a sudden a man walks in and grabs you and says, you have to come with me. You're never going to see your family again. You're never going to talk to them again. You never, ever, ever, ever will see them again. And you also have to come and work for the rest of your life on my farm for no money. And you will have no access to your friends, your old life at all. It's obviously going to be very saddening. Um, some slaves still married, but these married marriages were not legal. Um, they were not legally recognized. Some still had children, knowing with the, it, with the thought in their head that one day these children could be sold away from them and they would never see them again. But they're still trying to, you know, have some sort of family structure and stuff like that.
Uh, slave rebellions. So a lot of things are bad. So you might be asking, you know, why don't why didn't slaves rebel? They did. Sometimes they rebelled violently. It's an extreme case, but some did. Some enslaved people led armed rebellions. Most the most famous example of this was led by Nat Turner in Southampton County, Virginia. Turner led 70 followers who killed more than 55 white men, women, and children. Turner and his followers were soon captured when their ammunition ran out. So you might be saying to yourself, why didn't all slaves just band together? I mean, there were more slaves than there were white people. Why didn't they all just get together and fight the white people and, you know, take over? Well, a few reasons. One, just because there is a lot of slaves does not mean that they can communicate easily and organize. Actually, it's very difficult for all of them to communicate, organize a rebellion. You can't just, you know, send a text message out or an email saying, you know, hey, we're going to all revolt against our slave owners right now. It would be little pockets, like 70 people, 70 slaves, with like what Nat Turner did. Another thing is this last point down here where it says their ammunition ran out. Um, you have to understand that you, as a slave, you do not have nearly the access that the white people do to ammunitions, guns, and when your ammunition as a slave runs out, you're done. You're you're out of you're out of stuff to fight with, so you uh, you can't just go get more. Um, and if the other guy that you're fighting still has bullets and you don't, you're in a little bit of trouble. Turner was tried and hanged, um, so they found him guilty and hanged him. Um, this rebellion scared a lot of slave owners in the South. Why would it scare a lot of slave owners? Well, they obviously are kind of freaked out by the fact that. We're living amongst a whole bunch of slaves that are all angry at us, and at any moment they could r rise up and revolt and kill us. Because if you're a slave, who's the first person you're going after? These people, the slave owners. Okay. Um, so state legislators p started passing laws which even further limited the rights of African Americans, both free and enslaved. Um, so they're trying to crack down, make sure... African Americans don't get any ideas of rebelling because they want to make sure that if they do, they were going to be punished severely. Um, out of this, a common culture among African Americans starts to develop. By the 1830s, a distinctive African American culture emerged in the South. This common culture helped enslaved people bond together and endure plantation life. Now, it did not make plantation life fun or enjoyable, but it did help get them through plantation life. I use the example that, you know, if you have a lot of yard work to do on Saturday and, you know, it's either you do it by yourself or somehow you get four friends to come over and talk with you and help you and, you know, work together to get this thing done and share stories and, you know, talk and hang out while you're doing yard work, which one of those examples is going to be more enjoyable? Obviously, the one where you get to share ideas, talk, have a good time a little bit, um, enjoy the little things, but you're still doing yard work and it still kind of sucks. So, you know, religion was a cornerstone, cornerstone of this African-American culture. Um, in the beginning, slave owners used religion as a way to say, you know, you should follow what we're saying. Because in the Bible, it says, servants shall follow their masters, and all this kind of stuff. But slaves and African Americans at this time start reading the Bible in a different way, and they start focusing on um, the book of Exodus and the story of Moses, how Moses led his people out of Egypt where they were being enslaved and led them to freedom and all this kind of stuff, so... Um, yeah, music was also a large part of this culture. Enslaved people sang spirituals or songs that expressed religious beliefs. Spirituals would sometimes contain coded messages about plans to escape. We'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about uh, the Underground Railroad. But for example, there's a song about you know following the drinking gourd, and that's all about following the Big Dipper and the North Star if you want to you know run away and go north and all this kind of stuff. So coded message to help these out. To help the escaping slaves or plans or to escape or whatever. Um, these spirituals later would have a strong influence on blues, jazz, and other American music. So that African American culture that it's, gets set up in the 1830s is present in today's music, in blues and jazz, and you know all the way through American music. So, so yeah, that is the 
second lecture of unit 10 or unit 11 and the spread of slavery and plantations hope you really just enjoyed it thank you and goodbye